Hello, everyone. Uh, I was told that it's time to start. It's great to have you all here. Uh, it's been a fantastic school so far. I've enjoyed all the lectures I've attended. And uh, I'm excited to share my own uh, experience with you guys. Uh, about six years ago, I was an attendee of uh, the school back in 2009. And uh, it's an honor for me to be back here as a lecturer. Uh, so let me kick it off uh, by showing you um, a rendering of a 3D simulation of an accreting black hole. That's a disk, that's a whirlpool of gas from which the black hole feeds itself. And uh, naturally, as we, we will see uh, throughout the talk, uh, black holes consuming gas are often accompanied by these collimated outflows or jets. Uh, and I will focus on uh, the magnetic mechanism of launching of these jets. Uh, hence the name of the talk, the title of the talk, Black Hole Magnetospheres, because that's where the jets originate in the magnetosphere, very close to the black hole event horizon. Um, to set the record straight, um, let us briefly overview where we see black holes around us in the universe. Um, they come in two broad classes. Supermassive black holes with masses ranging between millions and billions of solar masses. These are found at the centers of galaxies. And stellar mass black holes with masses ranging between a few and maybe 10 or 20 solar masses. Uh, and these are found in binary systems, such as uh, a normal star orbiting uh, a stellar mass black hole and donating its gas either through a Roche lobe overflow or through a wind. Uh, these are called black hole binaries or simply X-ray binaries. You can have a neutron star instead of a black hole or another object, by the way. Gamma ray bursts, um, which are short duration gamma ray bursts in this case, um, are, as a re are form as a result of a binary merger of two neutron stars or a neutron star and a black hole. Uh, and long duration gamma ray bursts or core collapse gamma ray bursts, uh, they are the end product of the evolution of massive stars where the star exhausts its fuel, uh, its core collapses to form a black hole or a neutron star that is rapidly spinning and uh, uh, the rotation of the central object uh, can launch a pair of relativistic jets and if you happen to be along the line of sight of this jet, if this jet points towards us, uh, then we will see a bright flash on the sky, uh, which is where the name uh, for the gamma ray bursts came from, bright burst in gamma rays. Uh, recently, there is evidence for an intermediate uh, mass black hole um, population. Uh, not surprisingly, it's called intermediate because it fills in the map uh, gap between the supermassive and stellar mass black holes. Uh, and uh, uh, it's really a topic of, a really hot topic, uh, really hotly debated. What is the origin of this intermediate mass black holes? Uh, they can be either a low mass end distribution of supermassive black holes or a high mass end distribution of stellar mass black holes. Probably it's a combination of both. This is a really exciting topic. I will tell you about a few developments that happened just in the past few years uh, in a few moments, uh, but let me, uh, take a pause here and, and draw your attention to the fact that all of these black hole systems uh, produce relativistic jets. All of these are artist de depictions except this one, which is an actual simulation. And this is the only one that doesn't have a jaw drawn here. I decided not to draw it by hand. But jets is uh, how we know about these binary mergers uh, as they appear as a short gamma ray burst if the jet is pointed toward us. Uh, just to be fair, you do not have to have a black hole event horizon to produce a jet. Uh, the neutron stars and white dwarfs uh, produce jets just fine and we observe them. And this is an actual observation of a jet produced by a star. So stars do that as well. So this suggests uh, that there is something very simple about the physics of jet production that doesn't really care about the physics of the central, the nature of the central object. Um, and uh, this is something that I will focus on in a moment. But before I go there, let me convey the excitement and um, uh, the dynamical uh, nature of this field because in just a few years, we discovered completely new manifestations of black holes. 
For instance, uh, if a star is so unlucky that it comes too close to the black hole, it would get tidally disrupted, and that was predicted a long time ago. Uh, but only recently did we get evidence uh, that these tidal disruption events can actually produce jets, which allows us to detect these events very far because jets beam radiation and make objects appear brighter. Uh, recently, there was a surprise. Um, the new star satellite uh, detected pulsations in one of the ultra-luminous X-ray sources, uh, which um, proved that it was actually a neutron star instead of a, an intermediate mass black hole. Uh, so neutron stars can be uh, powering uh, these really bright sources uh, that uh, produce too, many, uh, too much X-ray emission for their mass, even though they are so small. Um, recently, there was uh, an observation uh, of what we think could be uh, a signature of uh, our process, nucleosynthesis, in the ejecta of the binary merger disk. Uh, and uh, that opens up exciting new ways of hunting uh, for the binary mergers in the local universe, uh, which is particularly hot topic because of the recent LIGO detections uh, of merging black holes. So when a black hole neutron star, neutron star, neutron star merge is detected, the hunt will be for these um, um, smoking guns, uh, signatures uh, in, the, um, in the optical and UV uh, spectra. And uh, finally, uh, very recently, there was uh, a surprising observation of a long duration, extremely long duration, uh, long, uh, gamma ray burst uh, that was accompanied by a magnetic explosion. Uh, usually, we think of jets, uh, usually, we think of magnetic fields as either powering a, an accretion, sorry, either powering um, a, a jet or an explosion. In this case, they were both happening at the same time. And how this happens is a mystery. Uh, so, a lot of puzzles to be worked out. N not many things are actually known in this field. And I will try and tell you um, a little bit about what we think we know. So what do we know? Uh, how do we know that jets move? How do we know that they're collimated? Well, because we see those jets, uh, and there is a lot of uh, wonderful work observ that observers do for us um, that allows us to um, compare our models to. So for instance, in this case, I'm showing you data for a beautiful active galactic nucleus, 3C279. Uh, and on the left panel, I'll show you snapshots in the radio uh, of uh, the source ranging uh, from 1992 to year 1998. And what you're seeing here is that there is a central component which doesn't really move in time. You see it's at the same uh, location uh, that is associated with the central black hole. Uh, and then you can see the jet and uh, one component that is moving away from the center. You can draw a straight line to measure its slope to see how fast it moves on the sky, and uh, you find that it moves faster than the speed of light. Uh, that sounds ridiculous at first, but actually there is nothing uh, about the uh, theory of Einstein, uh, Einstein theory of relativity uh, that is broken here. Uh, nothing physically is moving faster than the speed of light. This is just a pattern speed as it appears on the sky. Uh, and the fact that this uh, apparent velocity on the sky exceeds the speed of light is actually telling us um, about the velocity, the intrinsic velocity of this jet. If the jet points almost toward us, as it does in this system, and it's moving very close to the speed of light, the jet is catching up with the radiation it produces, with the photons it produces, and this is what leads uh, to this apparent superluminal motion. Uh, in fact, the underlying physical velocity of this jet is inferred to be 99.7% of the speed of light. Uh, and this jet is, I think, just a couple of degrees uh, away from, uh, pointed away from us. So we are basically right in the laser beam of this jet. Because the jets are so tightly collimated and focusing all their power in this really tight opening angle, it means that they will appear very bright to us. Moreover, because they move toward us, the Doppler boosting um, makes these jets bright across a wide range of wavelengths, including the high energy emission. So for instance, here is a broad band spectrum of this source, and it extends from a low frequency radio to the very high energy gamma ray emission. Uh, and there are a lot of instruments uh, that we can use uh, to study uh, the emission uh, of uh, this jet uh, and the similar jets. For instance, in the radio, uh, there is a beautiful um, ALMA instrument and many other uh, instruments, just showing you the latest and greatest. Um, in the infrared, optical, and UV, we have a lot of ground-based uh, facilities, uh, including uh, space telescopes, of course, of, uh, in addition to ground-based. 
Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is an example. In X-rays, we have a lineup of X-ray satellites, uh, Chandra, XMM Newton, and on higher energies, uh, New Star. Uh, when we move to gamma rays, we of course have Swift and Fermi, and uh, the TEV gamma rays can be observed uh, using uh, uh, Hawk and Magic telescopes uh, as an example. Uh, jets do not have to talk to us, and black holes do not have to talk to us via radiation. Uh, they can, uh, like, like we can, we can see the radiation uh, by using the Cherenkov telescopes, but we can also detect cosmic rays, which we think uh, are produced in at least some of the jets. Uh, we can also detect high-energy neutrinos, for which uh, the jets of active galactic nuclei are uh, a potential source. Uh, and of course, uh, we can detect gravitational waves, which are signatures of merging black holes, um, and uh, probably the jets that those black holes produce. But we should uh, think and study jets, not just because we can see them or detect them, but also because they play an important physical role in the evolution of the universe around us. Uh, for instance, here I show you an example, a uh, very well-known uh, image of the Perseus Cluster, where you see the jets influencing the surroundings in a dramatic fashion. They blowing out bubbles filled with hot magnetized plasma and sending shock waves uh, into the surrounding medium, thereby heating the medium and perhaps preventing the black hole from accreting too fast. Uh, also, uh, perhaps keeping the gas hot, uh, which otherwise uh, would undergo runaway cooling. Uh, in the M87 galaxy that I will talk more about later in the talk, uh, in the next talk as well, um, we see more of the same shocks and cavities blown out by the jets. And in this dramatic example of the uh, cluster MS0735.6, uh, we see huge cavities blown out, presumably by the jets powered by the central black hole. And what's really puzzling is that the entire power, the entire energy associated with those cavities uh, is comparable to the rest mass energy of the black hole. It's almost as if, if this black hole was nearly maximally spinning, uh, the jet somehow managed to extract all of that rotational energy and dump it into the ambient medium uh, over the past uh, maybe 10 or million years or so. Uh, how that can happen is really an open issue, and this motivates the understanding of what determines the power of these magnificent outflows. We can try and look at how the jets are produced and what sets their power on a more quantitative level uh, by plotting, for instance, the mass of the central black holes versus uh, the velocity dispersion of the stars in the bulge of the galaxy. Uh, here's an example of a plot by Scott and collaborators um, uh, back from 2002. Uh, and what we see here is a tight correlation between the mass of the central black hole, which is a tiny little dot at the very center of the galaxy, and the central part of the galaxy, which is huge, much bigger than the sphere of influence of the black hole. So the black hole cannot talk to the stars uh, whose dispersion is plotted on the x-axis, yet it somehow knows very well about how fast the rotation in the galaxy is. And how do black holes talk to their surroundings is an open issue. It could be a product of co-evolution of black holes in the galaxy, or it could be perhaps um, due to some mechanism which allows the jets to talk to the surroundings, perhaps due to jet feedback or radiative feedback. Yet another way of quantitatively looking at uh, jets and their interaction with the surroundings is to plot the radial luminosity uh, of uh, active galaxies uh, versus uh, their nuclear B-band luminosity, uh, essentially the optical light. And both of the axes are on the log scale. And so what we see here is we see uh, two tracks uh, of galaxies, very well separated tracks. Uh, the top track is called the radio loud track and the bottom called radio quiet track. And that's because for the same optical luminosity emanating from the sources, and therefore we think the same rates of accretion at which these black holes consume the mass, we see very different radio luminosities, different by as much as three orders of magnitude on average. And if radio luminosity is a tracer of jet power, as um, many people suggest, uh, then what this tells us is that in addition to uh, the black hole mass, which is roughly the same between these two uh, tracks, and the mass accretion rate, which is the same as well at the given uh, luminosity, 
at a given value of the x-axis, there must be some third hidden parameter um, which tells a black hole whether it lands on the top or in the bottom track. What this parameter is, is not agreed upon. Uh, there are m several possibilities that have been suggested over the years, and I'm listing here just a few. Uh, it could be that the magnetic flux is different between these two tracks. Uh, stronger magnetic fields will produce stronger jets. Uh, so the top track may have uh, more field of a higher magnitude, uh, and the bottom, um, uh, the bottom population has a weaker field. It could be that there is a difference in the ambient medium. Uh, maybe the radio emission traces not just the jet power, but the interaction with the ambient medium. So if there is more material that the jet interacts with, uh, that will lead to more radio emission produced. And so this is just an illusion, uh, not a real uh, dichotomy in the jet power. And finally, the third possibility is maybe the black hole spin is different between these two populations. If a black hole uh, is spinning faster, it produces more uh, jet power and therefore more radio emission. Uh, it's probably a combination of all these three um, possibilities, and uh, it's not clear how we will be able to resolve this. Perhaps we could try and take a look at these jets with our eyes, and that will give us some suggestions as to what can be going on. So these are two of my most favorite jets. Uh, this is a Cygnus A Galaxy jet, and this is the M87 Galaxy jet. Uh, both of them uh, host uh, similar comparatively large black holes, uh, about 10 billion solar masses each. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see that even though the black holes are rather similar, the morphologies of these jets are really rather different. Uh, you can see that here these jets are really thin and straight and end up in a bright hot spot, whereas in the other case, in the case of the M87 galaxy, the jets are kind of wiggly and unstable and uh, disappear into nothing ending up in a swoosh. Um, this dichotomy in jet morphology has been known for a long time, since 1974, for more than 40 years now, uh, and there is no well-agreed explanation for this, um, which I will get back to trying and answer what is causing this dichotomy uh, in the second talk. Meanwhile, um, what we've seen here is that for very similar black holes, we find in very different morphologies, and it's unclear what causes this. Could it be differences in the central engine, or could it be differences in the surroundings? So maybe if we could only zoom in onto the very center, the very central black hole, and make an image of it, we would be able to answer all the questions right away. Maybe we will see a signature of black hole spin, so we will be able to measure it. We will know how massive the black hole is and how much gas has fallen there. And all of the questions will be resolved. In fact, we can do this already. Uh, from the scale of 3,000 light years, we can zoom in to the scale of only one light year. That is by a factor of about 3,000. Uh, and this, is, this observation is performed by very long baseline interferometry. That is a, a bunch of dishes uh, spread out over a largish area uh, that correlate the detections and uh, act together as a bigger dish that allows to beat down on the uh, diffraction limit. Uh, and what you see here is that the jet is produced somewhere here. Which this is called the radio core, uh, which is actually not where the black hole is. The black hole is a little bit to the left. You can see the jet going to the right and up and you can see pattern moving away from the center. So we think is, what we think is going on here is the jets are produced very close to the black hole uh, with a rather small velocity, and as they move away, they accelerate faster and faster, and in fact, uh, by the time this jet would have gotten here, it would have been already moving highly relativistically. You can get a hint that this jet is moving relativistically, not because of the proper motions, which suggest that, but because you do not see the counter jet too well. In fact, there is almost no emission here, right? This jet is booming, and this jet is almost not there, but you see its effect on the ambient medium. So what is happening here is that this jet is um, pointing almost toward us. It's, I think, misaligned with our line of sight by about 15 degrees. So we are seeing significant Doppler boosting of this one jet. But in, uh, intrigue, an intrigue here is that we see signs of counterjet very close to the black hole. So by looking at the ratios of, um, of brightnesses on both sides uh, for the two jets, we could perhaps reconstruct how fast the jet is moving. 
So let's try and zoom in even further. Let's try and make an image of an actual black hole and see if we can try and get out something useful out of it. Uh, so this is an image on the scale of 1,000 black hole gravitational radii. These are the images on the scale of just 10 black hole gravitational radii. These are not the usual images. These are actually Fourier transforms of images in the direction where we were able to spread the dishes onto different continents. So this is also very long baseline interferometry, uh, but uh, it is on the baselines between Hawaii and California and Hawaii and Arizona. So this is the triangle uh, of base stations uh, that allowed uh, to make uh, this Fourier transform. Yes? Do you want the misalignment for the other case? Uh, for which one? For the other top. Oh, it's almost in plane. Uh, for the Cygnus A, for the Cygnus A, it's almost in plane. Okay. Um, so uh, here, um, what we're looking at is a Fourier transform of an, of an image. And uh, if we were looking at a Gaussian blob and we made a Fourier transform of an, a Gaussian blob, we would see a Gaussian blob in a Fourier space. A uh, Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. Uh, what we're seeing here uh, is this several sets of points for each of the source that correspond to different combinations of, of, uh, of the base stations and therefore the different baselines. And uh, uh, the, the Gaussian fit is shown with a solid line and the dotted line shows a Gaussian with a circle, which you expect if there is a source behind the black hole and you would see an Einstein ring uh, lensing, uh, the, the, the result of the lensing by the black hole of a point source from behind it. And you can see that in, this, in these both cases, we are not able to tell apart between these two models, uh, which suggests that we better have a good idea of what we're looking at before we try to interpret these observations. Uh, you can put it this way, data is interpretation limited. We need to have a prior, a good guess for what we expect. Uh, this uh, topic of imaging the black hole on small scales is really hot right now because in April next year, we expect to um, have observations of the Sagittarius A star. Uh, oh, I forgot to tell you that these two black holes are the two largest black holes as they appear on the sky. This Sagittarius A star black hole is the black hole at our galactic center, uh, and it's about twice as large in its apparent size uh, as the black hole at the center of the M87 galaxy. Uh, the M87 galaxy is about 1,000 times further away than the center of galaxy, but it also hosts a black hole that is 1,000 times more massive or so. So these two black holes are just within a factor of two of each other in size, which makes them primary targets for these sorts of observations. Um, and why this is so important right now and timely is because in April there will be more base stations added to the, to the array, uh, which is uh, called the Event Horizon Telescope. And we expect to have images not like this, but approaching that, going in that direction, produced of the accretion flow around Sagittarius A star. And this is one of the simulated images uh, carried about, out by student Sean Ressler, who is here in the audience. Um, and we're trying to try and understand what sorts of morphologies we're going to expect, what sorts of spectra, and how can we invert the observations uh, into the physics uh, that underlines uh, the model. Uh, let me now take a step back and, yeah. Uh, so this is showing uh, a 230 gigahertz image uh, that you would predict to see with the Event Horizon Telescope. And what you see in here is a combination of emission from the jet and an accretion disk. Uh, you cannot really tell the two apart too well. Actually, in fact, most of this emission is coming from the jet, at least in the model that I'm showing here. And how much of that structure is real? How much is the limited coverage of the UV plane? So this was not uh, filtered through the actual uh, baseline station's um, uh, response. So this is an image as we would see if we were to come there and look. Um, but in reality, this image will be blurred, uh, both by the limited UV coverage, uh, the Fourier, Fourier plane coverage, because there will be only so many stations. Uh, this image will also be blurred by the Faraday screen, uh, by the interstellar medium, uh, and also a little bit by the scattering, even though at these high frequencies, probably the scattering is not a very important. The black hole, the black hole is uh, right there um, in the middle. So it's in the middle of the image. Any other questions? 
Okay, let me move on. I will take one step back right now um, and I will show you in very simple analogy how jets are produced by magnetic fields. So let us consider uh, a perfectly conducting sphere which is meant to represent the central object, be it a neutron star, a black hole, or um, a normal star. Uh, it could be a white dwarf as well. And uh, let us consider a ceiling which is meant to represent the ambient medium. It's also perfectly conducting. Uh, this is important because if we take a field line and we attach by one end uh, the field line to the ceiling and by the other end to the sphere, uh, then if we move the ceiling and we move the sphere, the field line foot point will have to move together with the surface. So if we now switch on the rotation of the central object at an angular frequency omega and wait for n rotations, then the initially straight field line will develop n toroidal field loops. So instead of a straight line, we have gotten a magnetic spring. Uh, what does it mean? It means that we now have toroidal magnetic field in this direction in addition to the vertical field. Toroidal magnetic field has pressure given by the well-known formula B phi squared over 8 pi. And so uh, this magnetic spring is pushing on the ceiling. Uh, if we wait for longer and longer, then more and more toroidal field loops will be put on the, on the spring. Uh, it will become stronger and it will eventually push the ceiling aside, break through, and expand vertically under its own pressure, which is a jet. It is expanding under its own pressure and accelerating any uh, plasma that is attached to the magnetic field lines. Uh, this is very similar to acceleration in a hydrodynamic nozzle uh, where uh, the flow expands sideways, its pressure drops, and the pressure gradient pushes it out. Here, the same thing is happening. You have sideways expansion of the jet. The pressure above is lower than the pressure below, and this pressure gradient pushes it out, except for one complication, which makes the systems really complicated, as you will see in a moment, uh, that there is also tension of the field. Uh, it's because the magnetic pressure is anisotropic, so it's described by a tensor as opposed to a scalar, and this is what makes a study in jets really complicated. For instance, if it were a hydro outflow, then all of the thermal energy, for instance, would have converted into kinetic energy at large distances and we would have ended up with a flow that is completely cold and moving at the maximum possible velocity. As we will see in the case of jets, because the hoop stress counteracts the acceleration of the jets, uh, these jets tend to lock in some fraction of the magnetic energy in the form of magnetic energy as opposed to converting it into kinetic energy. A, a convenient way of looking at these jets is the following. Uh, you can think of the jet as uh, continuously converting the initially vertical magnetic field, reprocessing it via rotation into toroidal loops at a certain rate. So these loops pop up um, from the black hole and fly out, sliding along the original magnetic field line. And as they do though, so, they expand, the pressure drops, and this pressure gradient pushes them out, uh, modulo the caveat that I mentioned that there is tension of these loops. So they are doing so reluctantly. So let us try and uh, figure out what is the power of the outflow that is produced here. And here I will focus on an example on the case of a neutron star. I will not start with a black hole right away. I will ease it in because we have a surface. We're comfortable with this hard surface. Let's try and see what kind of power will come out. Yes. Yeah, I, I think this was also what surprised me when I ran a lot of simulations that I will be talking uh, about in the next talk uh, when you actually include the accretion disk. I will not be including the accretion disk in this first lecture. Uh, that the system doesn't break the symmetry above, below the midplane by a lot. Uh, and uh, that's, probably, that's probably because uh, the disk doesn't move around too much above and below the midplane. So the things that are above and below the disk don't know about each other too much. And uh, they kind of evolve independently and jet production is rather robust. In both cases, the jets are collimated by the same accretion flow, just on different sides. So the pressures are similar, the force balance is similar, 
and therefore the jet power is similar. That's really my understanding of this. Uh, but if anybody has any suggestions, <coughs> I'm happy to, to, to talk to you about this. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, we have a neutron star and uh, we have magnetic field lines sticking out of the neutron star. And uh, I'm expecting to get a question. There are no monopoles in the universe. Why are you putting a monopole of neutron star? Because uh, half of these field lines should be going in and half should be going out because the total magnetic charge on the neutron star should be zero. And that's true. That is completely true. Uh, what I'm doing here is uh, I'm considering a really simple case when I don't have to worry about sign changes. In fact, we can make this monopole into what we call split monopole by changing the orientations of half of this field line such that they point in. Uh, and I will get to that in just a moment. For now, we have a neutron star spinning at angular frequency omega, and it has magnetic field strength on the surface uh, that's equal to B. Uh, how do we go about computing the power carried out by uh, the wind or the jets that the, this rotation causes? Well, the first concept we will look at is the concept of light cylinder. It is a distance at which if you were to rotate together with a star, you would be moving at the speed of light. Uh, it's really important because beyond this distance, uh, the outflow essentially separates uh, from the neutron star. Uh, and uh, you can consider it as a, as a wave. And uh, it's really convenient to compute the power of the outflow at the light cylinder. So the light cylinder uh, is uh, uh, such that omega times r of the light cylinder is the speed of light. Uh, and the magnetic field strength on, at the light cylinder can be estimated by taking the magnetic flux threading, uh, let's say, the northern hemisphere, uh, and dividing it by, uh, there should have been a square here missing. So dividing by the area of the northern hemisphere. Uh, how can we estimate the spin down power? Well, uh, we can integrate uh, the, um, the pointing flux uh, over the area of a sphere, uh, over radius, of the light cylinder, and then we get an expression which is very simple. Uh, it's uh, a characteristic magnetic energy density at the light cylinder, uh, B squared at the light cylinder times a characteristic length scale, uh, times the speed at which everything is flying out, which is the speed of light. Um, and then if we plug in the magnetic field uh, in terms of the magnetic flux, we are going to get the expression for the power uh, and what we see is that, not surprisingly, the power is some numerical prefactor, which is important if you want to quantitatively estimate what the power output of a black hole is, times the square of the magnetic flux, uh, times the square of the rotation. Uh, it's not a surprise that we have gotten, we, we ended up with a bunch of squares, because if we were to flip the sign of the magnetic flux, nothing would change in terms of power, so there's got to be at least a square there, and the same thing about the rotation. If we change the rotation, uh, to make it rotate in, in clockwise instead of counterclockwise, nothing would change. That's why you have to have a square here at least. Question? No. Okay. Um, now, uh, this was a very simple derivation. The actual exact answer is six instead of four. So when I was making these integrals, I made assumptions uh, and approximations and was rather loose, but it's pretty amazing that this estimate is giving you actually almost the right answer. So there should be an exact equality here. Uh, here I'm coming to the, back to the point of how to make it more realistic. Uh, if we flip the uh, direction of the magnetic field below the midplane, then we will end up with a zero magnetic charge on the neutron star, which is good. We don't want to have any magnetic charges. Uh, but the price we pay for it is we will develop a current sheet in the midplane because the magnetic field flips the sign. And while this is fine for theoretical consideration and changes nothing in terms of this derivation, uh, you can make sure that the energy flux is still pointing outwards even though the field orientation changed. Uh, what this does when you try and simulate the system numerically is it causes you numerical difficulties because the magnetic fields will be reconnecting it introduces time variability to the system that perhaps you don't want to have, is you want to study this really simple case and understand what is the power that's coming out. You don't want to be bogged down by these uh, extra complications. That's why in the exercises which I advertise are really illustrative and simple, uh, I will get back to this towards the end of the talk, uh, you will be able to run this simulation 
uh, with a black hole at the center uh, for the monopole field. There will be no current sheet to make lives easy. Uh, and you will be able to measure the spin down rate. Uh, and uh, you will be able to compare it to the simple formulas. So what about the black hole? If we were to replace the neutron star with a black hole, uh, what would change? Well, let us first uh, ask ourselves, uh, how is black hole different than neutron star? Well, there is one big difference. This black hole is characterized by just three parameters. The mass, the spin, which is the, uh, a way to parametrize its angular momentum, and the charge. Black hole has only three hairs. In reality, uh, astrophysical black holes, we think, have a charge that is essentially zero, because if they were positively charged, they would attract negative charge from the surrounding medium. And so in reality, we just have <coughs> two hairs in the black hole. And I cannot resist but to use this slide by Ramesh Narayan, uh, which makes the point really clear how simple the black holes are. Einstein had a lot of hair. Black hole has only three hairs, more likely actually two. So only two hairs, mass and spin. And what is really important is that black holes know nothing about the magnetic flux. They have no magnetic hair at all. So if you leave a black hole alone, it will not produce any jet or any radiation, classically at least, uh, not talking about Hawking radiation. So you need to have charges and currents around the black hole to give them a magnetic flux and for them to produce the jets. So when we switch to the black hole case, and this is the same picture as uh, I showed you for the neutron star, except I replaced the black hole, the neutron star with a black hole. Uh, here you see you have to have currents outside, and so you would have to supply these currents by some means. So keep that in mind. Uh, another important difference is that the black hole doesn't have a surface. So if we have a field line that's sticking out from the black hole, uh, it won't have a surface to be attached to. What it means is that black hole must do something else to cause these field lines to wrap around and rotate. And that is done through the rotation of space-time. So the frame, the frame dragon frequency, which I call here omega, scales with the radius roughly as r to the minus 3. At the event horizon, it's uh, given by omega sub h, uh, which is uh, proportional to spin, give or take a factor of 2, because the black hole event horizon radius changes as the black hole is spun up. Uh, but this is what it is. So if uh, I am near the black hole, I'm very close, then I will feel like I'm, my head is spinning because I'm going to be going around the black hole at this frequency. If I go further and further out, the space-time rotation uh, slows down, and at infinity, uh, there will be no rotation. So you can think of a field line that's starting in the black hole and ending up at infinity as it is sheared between the black hole and infinity. And because the field line is nice and tries to please both, uh, what it does it picks out roughly an average between the two. So it slips uh, through the black hole and through infinity at roughly the same rate. This is a very simplified consideration. You can show this um, more rigorously that the, the, this is the right answer. Uh, but what this allows us is to fall back to the machinery that we developed for the neutron star, because for the neutron star we had this expression uh, where we had omega, and now we know what the expression for this omega is. We can plug it in, and here you go. We're getting uh, a, the power output of an actual black hole without having done any GR whatsoever, except for this very simple approach. So black holes are actually very simple, even though intrinsically they might seem quite hard. So let me go back to this problem of black holes having no magnetic flux, because if I were to leave the black hole with this current sheet like this, uh, what will happen is that the current sheet would reconnect uh, and magnetic field would fly away and we will end up with a black hole without any magnetic charge as the Nohair theorem uh, stipulates. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Can you add those magnetic uh, no, current sheet in a steady state uh, configuration? Well, as soon as I leave it to its own devices, the current sheet will start reconnecting so it will not be steady state anymore. But will you develop other current sheets? Uh, you will develop you can develop plasmoids and tearing modes and so on, but once the transient is gone, you lost the magnetic field. And if you lost the magnetic field, then there is nothing to study because the black hole is just two parameters. Um, so what happens in reality is that there is an accretion disk that is doing uh, a very important job at transporting 
the large scale magnetic flux from large distances from the scales of a galaxy down to the black hole. And at the same time, it's preventing the reconnection between the field lines from above uh, to below the black hole. So the disk is what holds this magnetic field lines together in the black hole and allows the black hole to continuously produce the outflow. Uh, and uh, there are, this is, while this is the accepted picture, uh, that there is a disk that holds the magnetic flux on the black hole, where this magnetic flux came from is an open question. There are several possibilities for the origin of the magnetic flux. Um, there could be a patch of large scale magnetic flux that the disk grabbed from very, lo very large distances on the scale of the galaxy and delivered it and dumped it on the black hole. Or it could be that there was really no large scale magnetic flux and turbulence in the disk uh, through some process akin to dynamo generated large scale magnetic field loop that then ended up on the black hole. I will get back to this uh, important problem in the next lecture. But the bottom line here is that black hole must be accreting, there must be material around the black hole to keep the magnetic field on the black hole event horizon. And that's all I'm going to talk about uh, the accretion for this lecture. I'm going to focus just on the properties of the outflow. I'm going to postulate that there is some magnetic flux threading the black hole event horizon. And I'm going to ask what consequences are we getting? Uh, what are the properties of the magnetosphere in the outflow, magnetospheric outflow uh, that uh, results from that? So let us uh, now switch back to the neutron star. Now that we know that neutron stars and black holes are very similar, uh, you just need to plug in a different value of omega. Uh, and uh, uh, then I'm going to look from above down the rotational axis onto the neutron star. Um, what is going to happen here is if you have uh, an if you have a magnetic field line, so I'm the neutron star, and there, there, are, there are field lines that are sticking out from the equatorial plane, and I'm spinning. The field lines will be lagging behind me. So if you, if you look down uh, the barrel of a gun, the rotational axis, the, the equatorial plane is rotating, and the straight field lines will be lagging behind <laughs> this way, just like I draw here. So now let us zoom in onto this very small patch at the surface. So this is the blow up of the surface of the star. Uh, this field line is sticking out from the surface of the star. And uh, this is the initial condition. This is neutron star without any rotation yet. The field line is sticking out radially. No winding of the field by the rotation yet. Um, the surface is flying to the left with uh, the velocity v phi, which is uh, uh, given by the rotation rate. And let us wait for time period delta t. Uh, the foot point of the field line will be displaced by the product of velocity and the time interval. Um, and this information will propagate along the magnetic field line at the velocity of the waves, which is the Alvin speed here. Uh, so this distance over which the field line will be able to commu communicate the fact that the surface started moving is given by the product of the Alvin velocity times the period of time, delta t. Uh, let me make a key simplification for a little bit. I'm going to assume that this plasma is really highly magnetized. There is really no inertia to this plasma. So I'm going to assume that the plasma is massless or as it is called force free. So magnetic fields is what carries all the energy and there is no energy in the particles. Uh, all the particles do, they just provide the charges that instantaneously screen whatever magnetic field, electric field is developed in the frame of the charges. Uh, so this is a force free approximation and in this case, uh, the, um, the fast mode and the Alvin mode uh, travel at the speed of light along the magnetic field lines. So I can replace the Alvin velocity here. In fact, I already sneakily replaced it with the speed of light. Now we can actually compute what this angle is and figure out what are the components, what is the, co the component of the magnetic field which is responsible for energy extraction uh, from the neutron star. Uh, and that is the B phi component, uh, which is uh, given by the ratio of these two sides of the triangle, V phi over C, uh, times the radial component, the initial component of the magnetic field. So that's how an Alvin wave uh, launched out from the surface of the neutron star is establishing uh, the twist of the magnetic field lines. Uh, and uh, by plugging in what V phi is in terms of omega, we're getting this expression for what the toroidal field is. The electric field turns out to be exactly the same as the toroidal field. Um, by the freezing condition, um, we can write that E is minus V cross B over C. Um, what this means 
is that there is no electric field in the fluid frame. So if you were to jump into the fluid frame, then the electric field would be zero there. So that's just a Lorentz transformation. And uh, we are finding that E and B phi are the same in magnitude. Why do I care about this? I want to figure out how fast the jets move. Uh, what do I need to have for that? I need to know what the product of E, e cross B is and divided by B squared. That tells me what the velocity of the field is in terms of speed of light. And that is nothing but the ratio of E over B. So I know E, I know B, I now can compute the ratio. Um, and it's convenient to recast V over C in this form, as you will see in just a moment. I'm doing really basic algebra here. What I want is to ultimately compute the Lorentz factor, because that really is a convenient measure of velocity of relativistic outflows. When velocity goes to the speed of light, uh, the denominator, denominator vanishes and the Lorentz factor blows up. So large Lorentz factor means velocity very close to the speed of light. Um, and by plugging in uh, this at the bottom here, uh, we are get going to get this really simple expression, which actually is really deep. Um, several papers are based just on this expression, uh, so do not underestimate it. Uh, so what we have at the top is this B squared goes to the top, and I will decompose it into the radial component and the toroidal component. Um, and at the bottom, we have B squared minus E squared. Uh, so in, in our case, we know that E is equal to B phi. Okay? So this term goes away. And what we are left with is BR squared plus B phi squared divided by BR squared, or just like that, one plus the ratio of the components, which we know is equal to omega over C in a square. So we just derived how this radial magnetosphere will be accelerating as a function of radius. Uh, at the surface of the sphere, uh, where radius is essentially zero, uh, we're going to get Lorentz factor equal to one. Uh, well, for non-relativistic rotation rate, as is for most of the pulsars, that is the case, we will basically have Lorentz factor of one at the surface. As we move away from the surface, uh, from the neutron star, uh, then the Lorentz factor will be increasing uh, and uh, asymptotically it will be going linearly. So you can plot it on the log-log scale and you can see that Lorentz factor starts at one and then once we cross the light cylinder radius where this uh, expression goes to unity, it becomes essentially linear. By the way, I drew it not in Python, I drew it really in Keynote because I've looked at this plot so many times, I know exactly how they look like. You can, you can overplot it, the, the true solution, you will not find any difference, I assure you. Um, so this is the key takeaway from this plot, that the Lorentz factor asymptotically scales linearly with distance. If you think about it, there is something fishy about it, right? Because real system will not be able to accelerate up to infinite Lorentz factor, it would imply <coughs> infinite kinetic energy. But this is possible here because there is really no mass attached to the field lines. We made the force-free approximation. Uh, there is no inertia associated with the gas. So in order to include this inertia and figure out how a real system will behave, whether it will accelerate all the way up to infinity indeed, which it won't do, or it will level off at some level, uh, is an important question because that's what we observe. We observe terminal Lorentz factors. Uh, things stopped accelerating. So how does it happen? In order to address that, we need to look add the complications associated with having inertia in the flow. And the most uh, convenient way of doing this that I know of is to look at the conserved quantities along the jets. Instead of integrating uh, differential equations along the jet, we're going to look at a bunch of numbers, a bunch of values that are supposed to be conserved along the field lines. So one of these is the magnetic flux, which I will denote as F sub B, and the other one is the mass flux. Uh, these, both of these are conserved uh, because uh, mass doesn't get destroyed or created uh, in the jet. It just flows together uh, with the flow and so does the magnetic flux. So if we divide the two, if we consider their ratio, which I will call uh, eta, uh, then the ratio will be constant independent of the radius. I can similarly uh, do the same for the flux of the total energy. Uh, which is um, the electromagnetic plus the kinetic energy. Uh, electromagnetic energy is the pointing flux, 
and the kinetic energy is Lorentz factor times the mass flux. So far, so good. Makes sense. There will be a little bit of algebra here, but I, I spent a lot of time clicking in Keynote to make sure that all the animations work correctly. So I think you will see if it works. So why am I doing all this? There's going to be an amazing answer in just a moment. So if we look at the ratio of Fe over Fm, the energy flux to the mass flux, this is a really important quantity. What it's telling us is what is our energy budget? If we were to convert all energy flux into mass flux, how large would the Lorentz factor be? Uh, that really tells us the maximum Lorentz factor that a flow can have, and you, we will see it in a different way in just a second. Uh, so the first term here is the ratio of electromagnetic energy flux to the mass flux. But mass flux is kinetic energy flux over gamma, so we get getting a gamma times the ratio of electromagnetic to kinetic energy flux in the first term. And the second term is simply gamma, uh, because kinetic over mass flux is just gamma by this equality. Um, this ratio of electromagnetic to kinetic energy flux is really important. It's called magnetization and denoted by sigma. Uh, it's, it can also be expressed as the ratio of magnetic energy density in the fluid frame, which is B squared. I call the, the fluid frame magnetic field uh, with the small letter B. Uh, so it's B squared over 4 pi. That's the magnetic energy density in the fluid frame. Um, actually, it's enthalpy. Enthalpy in the fluid frame. There is a factor of 2 between the two. Divided by the, the rest mass energy density. So it really tells you how strong the magnetic field is energy-wise. Uh, and now we've gotten this really simple result that the total energy flux uh, can be decomposed into the electromagnetic part, which is uh, characterized by magnetization, sigma, and the kinetic part, which is just the Lorentz factor. Why am I talking about this? Well, because magnetization is always positive definite. That means we have proven that the maximum value of Lorentz factor cannot be greater than the, than the value of mu. Um, that's one first result. So if we know in a simulation, in a real source, what the value of mu is, we know that Lorentz factor better be below that. Uh, the next result is uh, that sigma is also a very convenient parameter because it sets the Lorentz factor of the fast waves. Uh, it's essentially the ratio of gamma times P of the magnetic pressure divided by rho. And that is really similar to the sound speed, which is uh, square root of gamma times P gas over rho. So that also means that we already have the fast waves in our consideration for free. Now, in force free, the magnetization is infinity because there is no kinetic energy flux. Uh, rho is zero. Uh, and the fast waves travel the speed of light, uh, which we can see from here. If we set sigma to infinity, the Lorentz factor of the fast waves, gamma f, is infinity. Now, remember that funny result when the Lorentz factor was growing out of bounds? When do you think that approximation will break? Let me think. So. If in force free, the fast waves travel at the speed of light means that you can never catch up with the fast waves. Means that if they travel not at the, fast of, not at the speed of light, but at a finite velocity given by this Lorentz factor, it means once we caught up with these fast waves, our force free approximation is broken. That's probably the Lorentz factor at which we cannot apply the force free results anymore. What Lorentz factor will this occur at? Well, that's that happens when Lorentz factor is equal to gamma f, or sigma to the one half. OK, um, how can we back out what the value of Lorentz factor is here? Well, we can use this relationship here and neglect one, assuming that the flow is highly magnetized. Uh, we will get an equation for gamma on both sides. And by solving it, we obtain the answer that force free breaks down at a really lot of, rather low Lorentz factor. Uh, mu, the maximum possible Lorentz factor, to the one-third. This is really a draconian constraint on the outflow acceleration efficiency. Uh, let me explain why. Let us imagine that we uh, created a really nice, highly magnetized jet, where this mu parameter is 1,000. So we expect to get an outflow with Lorentz factor of up to 1,000 
as a result. That would be fantastic. If it points to us, it will be so bright, everything is so beamed, amazing. We can see very far and study sources otherwise not seen. The only problem is that we are going to get a Lorentz factor of only 10 as a result because of the breakdown of our approximation. Acceleration ceases to be linear beyond this distance. In fact, uh, instead of this linear, nice linear dependence that we saw a few slides ago, we're going to get this leveling off of the acceleration. And this is one of the problems that I set up for you in the code that I shared with you guys. Um, and if you, have you gotten um, the information about the problem sets or assignments or the fun that you can have with the, with the code? Has anybody communicated this to you? There is a Git repository, I heard, where everything is contained. Uh, and uh, if you do git clone on that repository, there will be information about the problem sets. Uh, but if you haven't gotten it, I will send you a link to, to all of you. Um, I will ask Allison to send it. Uh, so there is a code that I'm sharing with you, uh, just like Anatoly Spitkovsky. Um, I'm going to make my code public for everyone so you guys can use it and uh, do science with it. Uh, it's really powerful, and I will give you more information about it. But this is just one of the simplest problems you can run on your laptop, and I will show it to you if I have time at the end of the lecture, that you actually can get a result that uh, the Lorentz factor saturates uh, very simply. So that is uh, uh, actually 1D problem. So you say that the mag magnetic geometry is exactly radial, one-dimensional, field lines cannot move around, and then in this case, you get a really flat distribution of Lorentz factor with this terminal value for it. If you let the field lines move around in two dimensions, uh, then there is a little bit of extra power that comes out. And that's one of the questions to try and understand why. Uh, Lorentz factor doesn't saturate exactly at mu to the one-third. It has a weak logarithmic dependence with radius that goes as uh, log to the one-third. And you actually can actually show it analytically in a really simple way. That's one of the problems that I'm asking you to take a look at if you're interested. But this is really depressing. Um, and I didn't mean to. I, I wanted it to be an upbeat presentation. So let me tell you right away that this doesn't have to be the case. And I will show you how you can get really nice acceleration for the jets. Uh, what did I want? Yes, badly accelerated. Yes, very badly. So why are things so bad? But remember, let's be optimistic. It will all be good at the end, like in a true good Hollywood movie, uh, if there are any. Uh, such movies. Um, so let's, let's try and investigate what kind of assumptions did we make that made the jets behave so badly. So let's revisit them. Uh, we started out with Lorentz factor expressed in this way. There is no problem with that. Uh, then we expressed it uh, through the field components. There is also no problem with that. That's, that's one to one. But then we dropped this term because we found that for the, for the split monopole geometry, B phi exactly compensated E. And that is actually where the problem <coughs> is. Uh, so let us try and uh, relax this assumption uh, that actually is breaking uh, in uh, the uh, case, even in the case of the monopole problem. Um, when we made this assumption, we said that the toroidal pressure, pressure associated with the toroidal field in the fluid frame, and this is pressure associated with the toroidal field in the fluid frame because um, you remember that, maybe remember that there is the relativistic invariant B squared minus E squared. It's the same in all frames. So if I jump into the fluid frame where E is zero, there is no electric field in the fluid frame, I will be left with only B, B squared in the fluid frame. That will be my pressure. That is the magnetic pressure in the fluid frame. Once I boost into the lab frame, in order to compute the fluid frame pressure, which is what I care about, this is what sets the force balance, I need to subtract E squared from it because that's, 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 what's the invari that, that's what is the invariant. The in invariant. Uh, sorry. So uh, this is the pressure associated with the toroidal field in the fluid frame. So what I said is it's negligible. Now, if it's not negligible, if I cannot drop this component, then my magnetic pressure is not just BR squared, but it's BR squared plus the fluid frame B phi. And this B phi will be varying laterally, and this will mess up my perfectly radial magnetic field lines, that will make them deviate and change shape. Uh, and that is an important uh, uh, difference, as we will see in just a moment. So now, let us go in the opposite limit. Let us neglect not this guy, but let's neglect the BR. 
So in the same formula, we will cross out BR, and what we will end up with is this ratio, which really doesn't tell me anything when I look at it. In fact, I have no idea how to compute this at all. Um, but um, we will do this in just a moment. Uh, but because the steroidal field is important, uh, I want to reiterate that the field lines will change shape and they will do something like this, and this will be crucial. They will move away uh, from the midplane, and that's what will prevent the flow from accelerating. Um, and why is that? On an intuitive level, imagine that you're driving a car, let's say, at one mile an hour. You can make as sharp of a turn as you want. Imagine now you're driving a car at 100 miles an hour. You cannot make a 45-degree turn right away, right? So the same thing happens with the toroidal field that's flying out along these radial field lines. If the field lines start to turn, uh, then it means that uh, the toroidal field cannot fly out too fast because otherwise it won't be able to make the turn. Uh, so this really small change in curvature of the field lines is what limits the Lorentz factor to what we see to the very low uh, value that we see. So fast jets can't make sharp turns, okay? Jets also obey laws of physics, just like driving does. Uh, so, except that they can move at the speed of light. So the speed limit there is the speed of light. Okay, so force balance across bent magnetic field lines. So here it will be, I guess, the, as hard as it gets math-wise. So see there is a gradient. I, I think Matt had many more gradients than, than, than I did. And uh, Elliot also did a lot of gradients. This will be very relaxing, only one gradient. And I'm going to approximate it with a finite difference. Okay, so uh, the two forces that I play now are both associated with the toroidal field. One force uh, is the toroidal pressure gradient, uh, which is uh, the magnetic energy density, uh, mostly toroidal field here because that's what we dominated by, by the, uh, divided by the cylindrical radius, um, because that's the distance, that's the, that's, that's, the, um, that's the distance over which you difference, right? This is a uh, gradient in that direction. And the other force is the, centrifug the centripetal force. This is the force that wants to straighten this field line. Uh, and that is um, the as effective inertia associated with the field, which is just the energy density, times the square of the velocity divided by the radius. This is really straightforward generalization of the usual V squared over R centrifugal force. So if we balance these two forces out, then we can actually back out what the Lorentz factor is, and it turns out to be given by the square root of the ratio of the curvature of this field line, which is this guy, this is the curvature radius, I somehow it disappeared from the slide, uh, divided by the cylindrical radius. So it turns out that this ratio of radii, uh, of curvature in, in one plane to the, to the other plane, to the, to the toroidal plane, uh, is what tells you what the limit of the Lorentz factor is. Now it turns out we can actually combine the limit of this guy, uh, of this complicated um, bent jet uh, limit on the Lorentz factor, to that really simple linear acceleration regime. Uh, that's because, uh, I, and I won't go into the details, but it's rather simple. If you take an expression um, for, for this, uh, this expression for gamma, uh, for gamma squared, and then you, uh, you say that this part is that, and that part, sorry, is this, then you can write down the total Lorentz factor uh, as the sum of the inverse uh, squares of the two expressions. So we'll have a linear regime and this nonlinear regime summed up in such a way that we are getting the answer. So this is really a remarkable result. We have done almost no hard computations and we have arrived at a first principles expression for what the Lorentz factor of an outflow is if you given the shape of the outflow. Uh, and you can actually also compute the shape, the, the curvature of the field lines uh, and that's one of the problem sets. Any other questions? No. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to understand how can we get the jets to accelerate better than bad. Better than bad. Uh, so how do mass-loaded jets accelerate and how do they do this efficiently? So we've tried to look at the radial outflow. It didn't work too well. So in order to understand what do we need to do in order to accelerate, for the jets to accelerate better, we need to understand what was actually the limitation. Uh, and it wasn't too clear. I mean, it was the curvature, but what would be the solution? So let's try and get at that. So here I show what we already worked through. 
uh, we have the two ratios, the, um, the mass flux per magnetic flux, the energy flux per, um, per mass flux, and uh, we have decomposed it into the magnetic part and the kinetic part. Um, magnetic part and the kinetic part. Uh, let us now forget about what we've done here. Let us massage the numbers a little bit differently. So the electromagnetic part stays the same, kinetic part stays the same, but we will make use of the fact that asymptotically, very far away from the center, our jets will be moving fast. Be it Lorentz factor of 10 or 100, doesn't matter. We are looking at a relativistic jet. If the jet is relativistic, then electric field and magnetic field will be very comparable to each other. So I will make this approximation. This is actually supposed to be approximate. Uh, e is approximately B phi, and it's given by uh, the product of velocity times B. This is really nothing than the freezing condition. And if I plug both of these in here, then I will get uh, the square of this uh, divided by 4 pi C. So I can plug this into here, and what I'm going to get is actually quite interesting. We have this combination here, uh, which is independent of the distance along the field line. Uh, omega is the same along the field line. If it were different between different radii, then the field would start to shear, and so it wouldn't be steady state. So in steady state, omega is conserved along the jet. Eta is also conserved along the jet. It's a conserved quantity. Um, so this is something that doesn't depend on radius. So if we go in along the magnetic field and asking how does it accelerate, then the only parameter that controls the acceleration efficiency is this uh, expression. B pi times the poloidal field strength times the radius squared, or uh, the magnetic field strength times the area. That's almost the magnetic flux, right, in the jet. So if we had a jet that, was, that had straight lines, um, then you can immediately see from here uh, that this is the magnetic flux, and we can rewrite this expression in, tr in this way. Um, you can see this by going to the very base of the jet. Uh, there, the magnetic field is uniform, so this is the magnetic flux. Uh, and you know that Lorentz factor is essentially zero compared to, to everything else. So this entire term should be equal to uh, mu times one, because this is the magnetic flux, that's the magnetic flux, these two go away. So we know that mu is equal to this. And this works at every radius, even though we derived it at the base, uh, now it works everywhere. So what this tells us is if magnetic field, poloidal magnetic field stays uniform within the jet, these two cancel each other out, mu cancels on both ends, and gamma stays at zero. It doesn't accelerate. So there is something very important here. If the jet stays really uniform and nice, there will be no acceleration. This is precisely why this monopole field didn't accelerate at all. Because monopole is really hard to change its direction um, because, it, because if everything is moving relativistically, you can only change by one over gamma, and that's a really change compared to the, to the theta angle. Um, the poloidal magnetic flux couldn't rearrange. It stayed almost uniform, and therefore there was no acceleration. Uh, you can rewrite this and see it even better in this way. If we divide both sides by, by mu and collect the terms, we can define acceleration efficiency, which is the ratio of Lorentz factor to the maximum possible Lorentz factor. It's one minus the ratio of um, magnetic, local magnetic field times the area divided by the magnetic flux. Again, this will be one if the jet magnetic field is uniform and therefore acceleration efficiency is zero. Uh, but if magnetic field somehow redistributes itself and becomes non-uniform, maybe we can get something out of it. So you need to reduce magnetic field strength or the local density of the field lines in order to accelerate in that region. But how do you do this? So how does hydroflow do it? How, how do hydroflows do that? As I already discussed, if we have a hydrodynamical nozzle, in order to accelerate, you need to expand. So that's why a nozzle cross-section increases as you go forward. Uh, the pressure gradient pushes you out. Here, just expanding is not enough. You need to expand in a non-uniform way. Uh, and how the jets, the actual jets do this, if you run a numerical simulation, uh, is they do this by bunching up the magnetic field lines in one area, so they sacrifice the pole, 
at the, and then they're able to accelerate near the jet edge. So the magnetic field lines go away from the edge, their density drops, poloidal field drops, that's how this ratio drops and the value of Lorentz factor increases. Does that make sense? That's called magnetic nozzle. It was envisioned by Begelman and Lee in 1994 and then uh, a couple of Russians, Sergei Komisarov and I independently arrived at that uh, in a numerical simulation. So this is really cool. We now actually see how jets can accelerate and they do so quite well if they are collimated. So let's, let's try and understand uh, when actually can they accelerate and what is required for that. Uh, so here is our uh, spherically symmetric cow model of a jet that is not collimated. Um, here is the fast point beyond which there is no way for fast waves to, to communicate to this center. Uh, so if we try to talk from just inside the fast point, then the waves can propagate. But if we're just outside, uh, at this point, then the fast waves are confined to the Mach cone with an opening angle of xi, which is given by the ratio of the sound speed uh, to the local speed, or the, in the relativistic case, the Lorentz factor of the fast waves, divided by the Lorentz factor, local Lorentz factor. And as you remember, uh, the Lorentz factor of the fast waves is square root of sigma. So this gives us the opening angle of the Mach cone. So for the, for the jet to accelerate, we need to get rid of the flux and dump it onto the pole. Remember in the previous slide? So can this point effectively accelerate? No, because this point cannot talk to the polar regions where all the flux wants to be bundled up by the solution. Uh, and so these field lines, the ones whose Mach cones do not cross the pole, um, they will not be able to accelerate. However, this field line closer to the pole will be able to accelerate because its opening angle of the Mach cone exceeds the uh, polar angle, theta. And uh, therefore, this field line can curve towards the pole uh, and achieve the local rarification of the field lines. So the condition for efficient acceleration is that the local polar angle, the, the polar angle is less than the opening angle of the Mach cone. Uh, and we can rewrite it in this way. Uh, the product of Lorentz factor and opening angle is less than sigma to the one-half or mu over gamma to the one-half uh, by the energy conservation we wrote out a few slides ago. Uh, so the limit on Lorentz factor now becomes relaxed. It's not just mu to the one-third. Remember that mu to the one-third? That was 10 for mu of 1,000. Now it's mu to the one-third divided by the local polar angle. So if here the polar angle is of order unity, therefore gamma is limited by mu to the one-third, near the pole uh, where theta is small, you can get much closer to the actual true limit of mu. So you can actually, in fact, construct solutions which reach uh, a good fraction of mu. Let's say for a mu of 1,000, you can reach Lorentz factors of 500 in the polar regions uh, where theta is of order of 0.1 or less. Uh, great, but uh, the jets that we consider, you can see that they are nowhere close to be monopolar. These jets are actually collimated. In fact, this jet looks like a parabola to me. In fact, people have gone in and measured and they found that this jet accelerates like a parabola over, collimates like a parabola over many orders of magnitude, about five orders of magnitude. So does this all at, at all apply to the parabolic jets? Can parabolic jets accelerate efficiently or not? That is the question. Um, as we discussed, communication is essential. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, the field lines that want to accelerate well can talk to the polar axis. So let me consider two field lines here, um, uh, A and B. Uh, and uh, what we want is that B is able to communicate with A and then A can communicate with the jet axis. This way we can bunch up the field lines near the pole. Uh, but you can see that if there was no communication across the jet, this field line would have not known the fact about the fact that the boundary is curving and would have run into the boundary. There would be collisions and it would be bad. The solution avoids these sorts of collisions. And so collimating jets naturally required to be in causal contact. Uh, the jet boundary uh, cannot have a Mach cone like that or else there would be 
self-intersections and collisions inside the jet. In fact, it's guaranteed that this uh, collimated jets will have much larger Mach cones. Uh, so in order for that to happen, we can find a condition just as the same as in the previous slide that the product of Lorentz factor and open angle is less than sigma to the one half. Okay, that is really, really good. Uh, it means that uh, in such collimated jets, we expect to have full causal contact so that there are no self-intersections and we also have placed an upper limit on something that we can actually observe. We can measure the Lorentz factor through the proper motions. We can measure the opening angles through the proper motions as well. Uh, and uh, we can maybe learn something about the magnetization of these jets from just these very simple observations. Uh, so how does our model fare with the observations? Uh, in collimated jets, we expect that the product Lorentz factor and opening angle is sigma to the one half and maybe less than order unity if the jets are efficient acceleration. Uh, in active galactic nuclei, we observe that the product is 0.1 or 0.2. So big check means that we win. But in gamma ray bursts, this product is huge. It can be 10 or 100. So something is really wrong in the case of gamma ray bursts. And there could be a few possibilities. It could be that the gamma ray bursts are unmagnetized, so everything that I told you can forget, uh, or at least in the context of gamma ray burst jets. Uh, but maybe there is some ingredient in the model that we're missing. And let's look at what that could be. So the jet that we looked at right now in the context of active galactic nuclei uh, is uh, looking as such. Uh, we have a jet with field lines starting out at the black hole and then they continuously collimate as a parabola. This is the jet that is limited to the product Lorentz factor and open angle to be less than one or two. However, in a core collapsed gamma ray burst, we have a star and a jet being collimated inside the star, once it leaves the star, has nothing to keep it together. So it will expand sideways. So can this effect be important? Let's look at what happens in a simulation. So you can run uh, idealized models of jets. These are beautiful because they allow you to study the properties of acceleration without wor worrying about accretion, time variability. These are steady state models. So we put a sphere at the bottom. Uh, we take a wall uh, that shapes um, the jet collimation. So we control all the aspects of the jet. And we start with the poloidal magnetic field lines. Color shows the Lorentz factor, log of it. Uh, blue is uh, Lorentz factor of one, and red is Lorentz factor of 1,000. And we consider two cases. In one case, the wall continues to collimate all the way through. In another case, wall collimates until the surface of a star and then decollimates at larger distances. And what we will see is that uh, this jet will reach Lorentz factors of 100 and the open angle of about 0.2 radians or about a couple degrees. Uh, and this one will reach much higher Lorentz factor of about 500 and about twice as large open angle, giving the product of Lorentz factor and open angle of about 20, much closer to the observed range. So let's see what happens. Once we switch on the rotation, and this is what you're gonna see in the code if you run the test problems, uh, you see that there is an outgoing wave at which uh, the flow realizes that there is a rotation at the base. And so uh, the outflow starts to get accelerated. And once the wave propagates out, you end up with uh, a steady state solution. Uh, and you can ask, what are the properties of the solution? You can see that here, Lorentz factor is yellowish, so it's about 100, as I said, and you can also compute what the open angle is, uh, and notice that this scale is about five times less than that scale. Uh, so it's really strongly stretched out for you to see the structure. On the right, something interesting happens. Once the jet exits what I call the star and the wall starts to curve outwards, um, there is a huge increase in the Lorentz factor. That is because this field lines suddenly have room to expand. Right, remember, acceleration is associated with expansion. So if the field lines before uh, reaching the surface, they had to redistribute, and you can see already signs of this redistribution. There are more field lines here per unit, length, per unit uh, distance than here. Uh, here, the field lines can just expand sideways and accelerate really rapidly. Another way of thinking about it is if there is more room to expand sideways, there is more room for the pressure gradient to develop. And so the pressure gradient is much stronger here that pushes the flow. Uh, the analogy that I really like is if you take a toothpaste tube, don't do this please though, 
and step on it, then the toothpaste will squirt out really fast. This is really what's happening here. Pressure here is huge, pressure here is very low, and so the jet is squirting out uh, like a toothpaste from a tube. Uh, so what is it going on here analytically? Uh, actually, all the three acceleration regimes and the new one uh, are included here. Uh, at the very bottom, uh, we have Lorentz factor increasing linearly with distance. As we go further out, we go into the regime where, which is limited by the curvature of the magnetic field lines. And as we go further out, uh, then we have this deconfined jet, the monopolar jet. In fact, the monopolar solution uh, describes this regime really well. Uh, and you get uh, the products of Lorentz factor and open angle much greater than one. So here is the summary. Uh, what have I talked to you about? Uh, if you want to get a jet, you want large scale magnetic fields and rotation. Combine the two, magnetic fields get wounded up into magnetic springs that expand and take away the energy from the center. Magnetic fields have only two hairs, uh, the spin and the mass. They do not have magnetic hairs, so you need to provide magnetic flux to them. This is the topic uh, of my next lecture. Um, how does the jet power scale with the parameters? Uh, the faster the spin, the more power comes out. The more magnetic flux, the more power comes out. The dependence is quadratic. Um, as we saw, the collimated jets do much better at acceleration uh, than unconfined jets. That's because they can bunch up the flux um, near the pole, and if the jet doesn't collimate, then there is no access to the pole that it has, so it cannot collimate too well. Now, I just wanted to make it clear that in this talk, I focused on the magnetic aspects of jets. There are other ways of launching jets, like radiation pressure, for instance, and I think that Jim Stone will probably be talking about those types of jets. Um, now, let me spend a couple of minutes discussing um, um, what kind of fun you can have with jets. And this is really the only thing that I will tell you. Um, if you want to compare how, the, if you want to see how the monopole has trouble accelerating and uh, get your hands dirty, uh, you can easily do this. Um, you can uh, go to the web page uh, of the code. Uh, if you don't have it, I will arrange for the email to be sent to you. Uh, go into the code and choose the problem name to this one for one dimensional problem or this one for two dimensional problem. Uh, and then run it, and then you can look at the results. And I can show it to you right now how easy and, uh, it is uh, to do so. So, how am I doing on time? Five minutes. Okay. Great. So what, uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and uh, show you the full life cycle of how you would do this. Uh, just to make sure that there are no questions. So this is a GitHub repository for the code, which I called HarmPy. So Harm is the code written by Charles Gami and collaborators uh, back in 2003. They made it open source in 2006. I picked it up and I parallelized it, made it three-dimensional, added a few bells and whistles. Um, and then I was struggling to come up with the code name because it's really Harm, but it's not really that harm, so I just added pi to it, which means, it's, which stands for harm MPI, and then I omitted one of the M's. Not really creative, but it will, it will do. Um, so if you, go, if you go to this repository, uh, then there is a tutorial uh, that explains how to get the code. Uh, and so you uh, get this URL, uh, this command, and uh, let's say go to and then uh, you do paste. Let me make it bigger so you see it. Can you see it? Okay. So that's it. We got the code. Uh, then what we can do is we can uh, open it up uh, and edit the file. Oops, I need to get into the code directory. Okay. Uh, so at the very top, there is uh, a choice for what sort of problem you want to, to study. And there is, a, uh, there is an option, monopole problem one, D, two, D, and so on. The default is torus problem, accretion of a torus, which is a lot of fun. I recommend that you run it at least once for yourself to, to get the experience. Uh, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run 
the monopole problem because it's really fast and can run on your laptop in seconds. And then all I do is I type make, or if you want, if you're impatient, you can do make minus J8, which will parallelize it on eight cores. And then the code has just compiled. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run it in parallel on uh, four cores, four, one, one. So the syntax here is really simple. Uh, you say how many cores you want to run it on uh, and say how many cores in each direction. And this is a one dimensional problem. So it only makes sense to stack cores up in radius. There's, there's one cell in theta, one cell in phi. So it doesn't really make sense to uh, give any, um, any cells in the direction beyond one. So you can see that this is the time uh, in the units of light crossing time. Uh, this is the time step value. So uh, you, uh, each, each every time step takes us about 0 0.05 time units. Uh, and uh, the, the grid goes between the black hole event horizon radius and 100, sorry, 1,000 gravitational radii. So it's dynamic range of uh, three orders of magnitude. You can, you can expand it and run it for longer if you want to get a better, um, um, better dynamical range. And the code will stop at 2,000, which is twice as long as the light crossing time uh, of the simulation. And now I can uh, run the Python script. Uh, it's, the Python script is located inside the code, so you can just run it like that. Uh, once you've got it, you can uh, read in the grid. And this is all um, given in the tutorial. Uh, and then we can read in the lost dump. And then we can uh, plot, and here I'm cheating, I have it in the, um, in the history. You can plot as a function of radius, so it's, uh, the, grid is to, the grid is actually in this, yeah, in, in this case it will work for both 2D and 1D grids. Uh, radius is sliced in the mid-plane, so the number of cells in the second direction over two. Uh, and then here, I uh, will plot in the Lorentz factor, which is uh, alpha times u upper t, which I also explain. And now that reminds me that I haven't computed what alpha is. Okay, so I'm going to plug that in, and log log, and bingo. I don't see where the plot is. Oh, plot is here. Okay, and now you see immediately the perils of the high performance computing. You can see that the Lorentz factor. This is log versus radius. It starts to level off, but then picks up. That's because this is a trail of the switch on wave. So in fact, what you need to do is you need to run the simulation for longer for this trail to move out. But you can see that uh, for a, actually magnetization here is about 60. And uh, by 1,000, you are only getting to about six or so. So you can, you can see immediately that the acceleration is pretty inefficient. But these are, these are uh, just, this is just a simple example of how you can make use of this code and solve a real life problem. Thank you very much.